Okay, so we'll go up to time so number 31. And that is Robert Gascoigne, Cecil III, and Marcus of Salisbury. Um, I should say with these titles, like uh, I think I mentioned this in a previous video, and with the exception of the Duke of Wellington, who was the first Duke of Wellington, most of the titular prime ministers were various numbers within that peerage. For example, um, if you just Google the Marcus of Salisbury, you won't necessarily come up with this prime minister. Uh, likewise, Earl Russell um, or Lord Derby, um, others, it, it's uh, not necessarily going to come up with a peerage. Um, Liverpool is another example, Earl of Liverpool. I believe he was the 14th Earl of Liverpool. So with um, the peerage, it's important if you're Googling any of these, if you want further information. I've given you links anyway, but if you want further information, you need to be specific because even though they were known by the title, so Marcus of Salisbury or the Earl of Derby or whatever, um, they were, um, it, it's good to be specific. Another quick point about the, the term Lord, that's a generic term for all nobility. So a Lord could be an Earl or a Duke or a Viscount or a Marcus. So Lord Salisbury, Lord Derby, Lord Russell, this was more or less a generic term. Incidentally, Gladstone and Disraeli weren't known as Lords, so it was never Lord Gladstone or Lord Disraeli. Although in the Disraeli video, I've just recalled that um, he was given the title later in life, the Earl of Beaconsfield, as was his wife. Um, but so I don't think I mentioned that in the video. So Disraeli is sometimes known as the Earl of Beaconsfield. Incidentally, Beaconsfield was one of Tony Blair's constituencies, by coincidence. Okay, so Robert Gascoigne Cecil. Um, from here on in, I'm just going to call him the Marcus of Salisbury. Um, he was born in 18, excuse me, born in 1830 at Hatfield in Hertfordshire. So that's seven years before Queen Victoria ascended the throne. Um, that would, unless I'm mistaken, make him the first prime minister in her reign to be younger than her. Um, he was born in 1830, Hatfield, Hertfordshire, and he became prime minister on three occasions. He was prime minister, I should say, on three occasions, 1885 to 1886, 1886 to 1892, and 1895, going into the 20th century to 1902. So three terms, a total of 13 years. And um, the interesting thing is that uh, he was actually quite an obscure figure compared to Gladstone, Disraeli or Palmerston, um, despite his longevity in office. In fact, Salisbury ranks as the fourth longest serving prime minister after Walpole, Pitt the Younger and Liverpool. He is the fourth longest serving prime minister, um, even longer serving than Gladstone. And yet, compared to the flamboyance of both Gladstone and Disraeli, he was quite a distant figure. Just reading a bit about his childhood biography, um, it's an interesting point here. It says that uh, he had a miserable childhood with a few friends. He filled his time reading and was bullied on mercifully at the schools he attended. In 1840, he went to Eton College, where he did well in French, German, the classics and theology, but he left in 1845 because of the bullying. The unhappy schooling shaped his pessimistic outlook on life and his negative views on democracy. He decided that most people were cowardly and cruel and that the mob would run roughshod over sensitive individuals. This may may explain his conservatism in his politics, uh, which brings me to the point he was a conservative. Um, from first uh, ascending to office, uh, he was 51, which is about the average age. Um, there is obviously a lot to say about Salisbury because a lot happened in his tenure, was quite a long time in office. Um, so rather than reading from a Wikipedia article, I'm just going to make it a bit simpler and read directly from Tom Downing's story. English policy is to float lazily downstream, occasionally putting out a diplomatic boat hook to avoid collisions. And it goes on to say, compared to the flamboyance of Disraeli and Gladstone, Lord Salisbury was a reserved, distant figure, yet he ranks among Britain's longest serving prime ministers. 
Born into an aristocratic family, Lord Salisbury was a descendant of Lord Burghley, a minister of Queen Elizabeth I. A frail child and prone to depression, he developed a love of books and botany. After gaining a fourth class degree in mathematics from Oxford, he set out on a world tour for the good of his health, visiting South Africa, Australia and New Zealand. He returned much stronger with a keen interest in the British Empire. Lord Salisbury entered the Commons in 1853 at the age of 23 for MP, as MP for Stamford, which I believe is in Lincolnshire. Turning enough support for himself and his wife, he started writing political articles for journals, gaining himself a reputation as a sharp and clever commentator. His first political post came in 1866 when he was appointed Secretary of State for India under the Earl of Derby. Less than a year later, he resigned in opposition to plans to extend the electoral franchise. That was the second great reform bill of 1867. In 1868, he entered the House of Lords following the death of his father and became Chancellor of Oxford University a year later. He maintained his intellectual interests, building a laboratory at Hatfield House where he experimented with electricity. That's another aspect I didn't know about, actually. Um, just to continue then, um, when the Conservatives returned to office in 1874, he became Secretary of State for India under Disraeli. Although the relationship started out stormily, it improved so much that in 1878, Disraeli appointed Lord Salisbury as Foreign Secretary, and he helped to secure peace in the Balkans at the Congress of Berlin. He took over the Conservative leadership on Disraeli's death in 1881 and reluctantly became Prime Minister of a minority administration in 1885. His first administration included legislation on housing the working class, but within months, an election for the shortest term. Returning to office in 1886, his second administration was much stronger, benefiting from the Liberals' internal strife. Reforms at home included the Local Government Act of 1888, transferring the administration of counties to elected county councils. I believe that's the year the London County Council was created. And in 1891, the Free Education Act abolished fees for primary education. Instead of the traditional role of First Lord of the Treasury, Lord Salisbury unusually combined the role of the Prime Minister with that of Foreign Secretary, a demanding double job. This is certainly all unusual amongst British Prime Ministers to combine both Foreign Secretary and Prime Minister. Um, Adopting a hands-off attitude to matters at home, his main interest lay in the direction of foreign affairs, especially British interests in Africa. His other political legacy was strengthening the Conservative Party by unifying different factions. Under his direction, the colony of Rhodesia, today Zimbabwe, was established, with its capital city named Salisbury. The Prime Minister's diplomatic skills were demonstrated in 1890-1891 for a settlement reached with the other European imperial powers over African territories. Uh, this was something known as a scramble for Africa with the Dutch, with the Portuguese. Um, so, for example, we got possession of South Africa, whilst Portugal got Mozambique and Angola. Just like one example. Um, by the time he became Prime Minister for a third and final time in 1895, it became a well-loved elder statesman. Home legislation included the Workmen's Compensation Act of 1897, making the employer liable for accidents at work. A broad problems of brewing in the Cape Colony in South Africa, and the Boer War broke out in 1899, splitting the cabinet and leading to his resignation in 1902. His nephew Arthur Balfour replaced him as Prime Minister, and I'll make a point about Balfour later, which is actually related to Salisbury. Um, incidentally, that Boer War we should technically say is the Second Boer War. Um, and finally, he died in 1903 at Hatfield House, his mother, his paternal home in Hertfordshire at the age of 73. Um, Salisbury is quite a distinctive figure, bald head, big beard. Um, he was also Prime Minister, and this isn't a major policy issue, but it's just a point of interest. He was Prime Minister at the time of the Jack the Ripper murders in the East End of London, so that gives a bit of context about the time. Um, some have even named him as a suspect, but I'm only throwing that for, you know, he, believe me, he was not Jack the Ripper. I'm just throwing that in as a uh, context for the time in which he was Prime Minister. Um, incidentally, and I'll mention this during the segment on Campbell Bannerman, um, the, the Second Boer War, like I say, 19th century statesmen tended to become popular during foreign wars, with the exception of Lord Aberdeen. Um, but the Second Boer War, um, 
included the use of concentration camps by the British. So it wasn't one of our more glorious moments, I would say. Um, if we can sum up Salisbury in one word, it would be two words. It would be British Empire. Um, like I say, he, he is a less known figure than Disraeli and Gladstone, but nor is he an obscure prime minister in the sense that he's he had quite a big legacy, especially within the Conservative Party. And I believe within the Tories, there's something known as the Salisbury Club or the Salisbury Association, which uh, was basically set up to remember his legacy. Um, he was prime minister, I believe, during Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897. Um, unless that was Gladstone, but I, I believe it was Salisbury at that time. Um, just double check. Yep. So he was prime minister at the very end of the 19th century. Um, and he was quite an interesting character because, like I say, he was distant. And he's certainly not exactly a household name today, but this this is someone who was prime minister for 13 years. And like other long-serving prime ministers like Lord North and um, Walpole, um, for some reason he's really not that well known today. Um, Salisbury, which is today Harare, um, was named in his honour. Um, just to give quick references to popular culture, um, Salisbury features with other prominent politicians of the day in two parody novels, based on Alice in Wonderland, um, Clara and Blunderland, and Lost in Blunderland, both published in 1903, 1902 and 1903. Lord Salisbury is a song by Al Stewart in his 2008 album, Spark for the Ancient Light. Um, in terms of media, I can't immediately think of any films that he's in, but I'm sure he's been featured in. I'd be very surprised if he does, wasn't featured in at least one um, one piece of uh, in some film or some um, documentary series. Um, that's interesting. In 1967, Clement Attlee was asked who he thought was the best prime minister of his lifetime. Attlee immediately replied Salisbury. Attlee didn't say Churchill, he didn't say Lloyd George, he said Salisbury. So for arguably Labour's greatest prime minister, to quote um, one of the top Tory prime ministers was quite something. Um, so obviously within his own lifetime, Salisbury was held in high regard. Um, why it is that he's not well known today may be down to his personality, difficult to tell. Um, he was very wealthy. Um, it said when he died, his estate was probated to £310,000 sterling, which would be £17.7 .7 million today. I don't think he was our wealthiest Prime Minister, I believe that goes to Walpole. Um, although certainly some of the early 20th century Prime Ministers would have been, I think Baldwin was pretty well off, Churchill, a uh, few others. It's difficult to tell who was our wealthiest Prime Minister. I think the Duke of Grafton was pretty um, wealthy. And certainly some of the Dukes from the early years, the Duke of Newcastle, the Duke of Devonshire. Um, trying to find out some more snippets to put in here because, like I say, Salisbury was in office for 13 years. There's a big statue to him outside Hatfield House um, in, uh, in Hertfordshire to commemorate him. Um, Major acts here in his time, the Naval Defence Act of 1889, which greatly enlarged the size of the Royal Navy, to ensure the two par standard which maintained the number of battleships to at least the combined size of the next two largest navies, which were France and Russia. So again, uh, going from the time of Palmerston, uh, this really was the pinnacle of British power. This was the absolute height of the British Empire. So inevitably, whoever was Prime Minister was going to be in quite a prominent position. Um, trying to think of some other interesting things that I can say here. Um, after the Bering Sea arbitration, Canadian Prime Minister Sir John Sparrow David Thompson said of Lord Salisbury's acceptance of the arbitration treaty that it was one of the worst acts of what I regard as a very stupid and worthless life. That's a pretty harsh assessment. So clearly, Prime Minister Thompson of Canada didn't. Uh, have much time for Salisbury. Um, Robert Blake considers Salisbury a great foreign minister, but essentially a negative, indeed reactionary in home affairs. So I think we can sum up Salisbury as 
consequential, but perhaps a field talent or perhaps a missed um, talent. I think had Salisbury a bit been a bit more active and hands on at home and made much more sweeping legislation, he would probably rank among the top five prime ministers. As it stands, he still ranked highly within the top fifteen, but um, not within the top five. So that's pretty much uh, Lord Salisbury. Any questions, feel free to ask, and I'll try my best to answer.